I walk the line by hewing to their experience and who they are, which are essentially happy survivors. So their story is really one of resilience and uh, thriving in the face of this great tragedy. Hi, everybody. I'm Ralph ben Rudy. Welcome to Not That Kind of Rabbi. Every couple of weeks, we put out a new one here at the CJN, and uh, we hope you enjoy them. If you have any feedback, you can get in touch with the CJN and uh, slash podcast, and you'll find something there. If you want to get in touch with me, you can reach me at ralphbenmergi.ca or at ralphbenmergi at gmail.com. Either one. Love to hear from you. Love to get ideas for upcoming episodes, and uh, hope you enjoy what we do. Um, so here's the deal. I don't know how many years now, about 35, 38 years ago, uh, I, uh, worked in Winnipeg and when I left for Winnipeg, all my friends who were Winnipeg, uh, Jews from Toronto said, you're going the wrong way. But I went and then two years later, I came home to Toronto again and I was doing some work at the CBC and a friend of uh, a friend said, well, they're doing this other show, a TV show, and they're going to do the Shaken All Over reunion in Winnipeg. We want you to go back. I said, I just left like like two weeks ago. I said, well, we're, ta- we're sending somebody with you who's from Winnipeg, so it'll be fine. I said, okay. I'd never met him. I said, fine. Uh, so 38 years later, uh, we've been friends. We've worked together in production. Uh, we're kind of family. And uh, in all that time, I always heard about his mom, and I always heard about his mom and the sisters, not as much about the brother, but the sisters, because they all eventually lived together in the same place to a very ripe age. And uh, the man I'm going to introduce to you uh, the son of one of them is the friend I'm talking about. His name is Alan Novak. He's put together a short film called Crossing the River. It's been uh, shown at uh, film festivals all over the world at this point. And uh, I'm just so happy uh, that he got to do it. He got to record. He got to uh, chronicle the lives of these extraordinary people, these siblings. And uh, he's here to talk about it. Alan Novak, welcome to Not That Kind of Rabbi. How are you? Thank you, Ralph. I'm terrific. Nice to be here. Uh, why don't we tell, the, well, you tell uh, people what story you were telling in Crossing the River. The thing that triggered it was the Spielberg Shoah Foundation, USC Shoah Foundation, um, through their research, named them or identified them as the oldest Holocaust survivors' siblings in the world, um, which is to say a group, four of them who all survived the Shoah, albeit in a in a different way, in a way that not as many people know the story of. So for me, this triggered this notion that, that my family, you know, who I always thought of as intensely ordinary, you know, modest, hardworking immigrants, post-1940, seven immigrants with an accent, you know, um, I, uh, I realized that they're actually kind of this really special group. And as I started digging deeper into their story, I realized the story is not as well told. What that story is, is Jews in Poland who ended up surviving the war by being um, shipped out by under Stalin's Russian army to Siberia, where they were in a forced labor camp for a while, and then ended up surviving the war by being so far away, you know, like the equivalent of of being in the Arctic um, from the fighting that they ended up surviving. So, and then they moved as a group to Winnipeg, and then they had a very long and, and happy and healthy life, but remained coherent as the four siblings until they were, you know, age 100, 99, 97, 95. And that's where I started, uh, to tell their story, going back to their origins in Poland and the whole war story and beyond. So this is Ruth, Saul, and Sally. These are the English names. And the Finks, basically, right? Fink was the the uh, uh, maiden name, the, the father's name. And yeah, they each, had, they each have three names. So my mom is Anne, Hania, which is Polish, and Hanna, 
um, in Hebrew, you know, Rivka, Regina, uh, Salka is Sally, is, you know, Sarah, Saul is Solomon, is um, Zalman. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 it's this tripartite Polish, Yiddish, Hebrew, English four, four way thing. And that which is how they communicated as well. So being a filmmaker yourself um, and deciding to tell this story, but being so close, your mother, your aunts, your uncle, um, how did you navigate the closeness of family and the objective eye of the filmmaker? You know, I would say in this instance, it's not a bug, but a feature. Uh, the fact that I was so, you know, that they're my family allowed them to sit down and just go into it, you know, get into the emotion to to uh, bicker between themselves as they disagree on details, which which I love is natural and very funny. And part of the story of the film is their relationships. You you see that uh, and it's kind of universal as well. Um, and on top of that, I mean, I've. I've been shooting them, you know, really since probably 1974. I've been, you know, I used to pull out the Super 8 camera and film satyrs and turn it into a little, you know, matzah beach party was one of my earlier ones. Um, you know, I'd use fast motion. I do crazy things. And then in, in Miami, once in 1990, I sat them down and got them to tell their story. But I had the, the forward thinking enough to make sure the lighting was good and the sound was okay on my little home video camera. So... So this has been a, a lifetime project in a way. Um, so it was a real advantage to be that close to them that I wasn't getting any kind of uh, protected answers. I was getting going right to the core very quickly. Yeah. Do you think somebody who wasn't you in this moment would have gotten their story or would they have been like, who are you? What do you really want from me? You know, it's, that's that's difficult to say because as, as they've gotten older, um, they had a lot of interview requests. It was really uh, different. Like... Um, a journalist came from uh, Bild, the, uh, the the largest newspaper in Germany, and he came from New York to interview them. And I think he got actually a pretty good interview. Like they got better uh, and better at recalling uh, the story. So I think they were. I think they're just pretty open people. I think I got more of the the the, the subtle humor of the relationships than they than they might have. But uh, in fact. Um, you know, they gave testimony to the Shoah Foundation. They've done various things uh, for different Holocaust education. So um, they're actually, they give a decent interview. <laughs> so the the thing that may have made some people go, what? what? So, that I noticed was, this is a happy story in the end. This is an upbeat story, and it's the Holocaust. Now, I think I've already told you years ago when A Beautiful Life came out. Life is Beautiful, a Benini film. I, w I really didn't like it. I really thought, you know, seriously, like, it's like, if you just keep your sense of humor, they'll be okay. It's like, no, this is the Holocaust. So how do you balance a really positive story with the horror of what was the surround to the story? You know, I, I in the film, I made a decision um, journalistically to stick with their perspective, what they saw, what they experienced. So, uh, so um, they were not at Auschwitz, you know, thank God. Um, so you don't see depictions of Auschwitz. They were, uh, they went to this place, they suffered a, you know, a, a difficult life, but not a, uh, you know, they weren't uh, tortured um, or, or degraded. And then, when they came back, everybody was gone. So emotionally, what you experience in this film is the story of kind of the, the panic of the invasion of Poland, the um, the decisions that were made that were gut-wrenching, then exile, and then kind of a tragic return and coping with that. So that, that is what you experience in the film. Um, and so uh, I, I kind of stuck with their experience, which is still very tragic. And it kind of their return. And there's a scene in the film that I'm very proud of that I used extensive um, uh, AI tools to recreate is kind of this um, large 
it's essentially 64 members of my family that were killed, brought reanimated um, as a as kind of a, a ghost like tableau, which is kind of one of the emotional keys of the film. And you really do experience what it must have been like to have lost so much, but not to have witnessed what happened. So, um, so I, I walk the line by hewing to their experience and who they are, which are essentially upbeat, happy survivors. So their story is really one of resilience and uh, thriving in the face of this great tragedy. So I just hew to their, their truth. And it does end up being, you know, the, my Aunt Ruthie has an amazing sense of humor. She was, you know, so I just let that play. So that is who they are these intense, horrible um, moments of loss, but ultimately they were together as a group and they, and they survived and they were, and they were young too. They were in their early twenties and late teens. So it's a different thing. It's a different experience. So I remain true to their spirit and their experience. So let's talk about your mom. Did you find out anything about your mom you didn't know in doing this film? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, uh, uh, you know, I came to find out a bit about her strength of character. You know, the after the war, she there was there was great uncertainty in Poland immediately post war. People there were roving gangs. There were guns. There were you know Jews who would show up at their um, village and and just be killed right by by Nazi sympathizers who were still around. So. Uh, I found out that she went on her own, took like a, you know, a, a long train ride from you know, Breslau, where they were, to Sanak, which is where they came from. And she went on her own and she went to find the plot of land where the family was and to to deal with the situation. And 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 that kind of bravery, and everyone thought she was so brave. She did that on her own. I've always thought of my mother as a, um, a more uh, fearful, nervous you know, classic Jewish mother. And, and I came to realize she actually was quite brave uh, at that time and, and stood up for her family. And she wasn't the oldest or anything. She just went and did it. You're lucky, right? Like you got to make this film and your mother was alive and your mother's passed away. Yeah. She passed, you know, um, so we, uh, we screened the film in Winnipeg. It was wonderful. All four of them were there on stage doing Q&As amazing. They just got to really experience it. We showed it at their assisted living home, the Shaftesbury in Winnipeg. And then we had our world public premiere of the final iteration at Lincoln Center in New York. And my mother was in the hospital and she was doing okay. You know, she had pneumonia and 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 she held on and we had this amazing event and it went well. And then I flew to Winnipeg the next day, and then kind of two days later she passed. Um, but I always say she held out and she held on. Um, and you know they used to just do everything for the kinder, you know, for the children. And I, I believe she really just wanted to make sure that this event happened and that we were, you know, we had our our, our great moment. And then and then she slipped away, and and my sister and I were there, and it was very. You know, it was it was a very emotional and very real, but very human moment. And she waited, and she was a hundred, and hmm. she was ready to go, as she said, and and she went. So yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Imagine if you'd done this, uh, you wanted to do it now, and your mother had already passed. How much you would have lost, right? It was a remarkable confluence of. Of timing, the way it worked out, and and you know the 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 day two days after that Shoah Foundation article came in, I literally had uh, on Facebook I had a lot of support. You know, I'm in the in the film industry, and uh, a couple of producers asked me if the rights were available for my story. <laughs> I just went, I'm getting, I I better book a ticket. I and I I flew to Winnipeg that in, in days to get uh, an interview because, you know, I was appreciative of, of at 100, you don't take anything for granted. This is an addition to be a cantor. But I don't want to be a cantor. I wasn't raised with any 
I welcome Sam into my community by first taking his foreskin and next showing him the beautiful Twister bagel. Culturally Jewish is the only podcast covering the weird, wide world of independent Canadian Jewish art. Listen to Culturally Jewish at the cjn.ca slash culture or wherever you get your podcasts. So you took this film, you've taken it to quite a few festivals now, but the one I'm really interested in is you went to Poland. Tell me about showing this film over Poland. That was a real, a real dream and a really, really fascinating experience and a real coming full circle for the project. So my, my family grew up in a town called uh, Sanok. Um, which before the war had about twenty to thirty thousand people. It's it's about the size of like in Ontario Huntsville, you know, um, a, a small city, uh, but a city. And um, uh, as I was making the film, I kind of uh, thought to reach out, and I, I I reached out to the museum director there. And this is about two years ago, as I was editing the film, and he got very excited, and he said. You know, there's a an actually a big film event that kind of like a traveling film festival that's going to be here in Sanok in in August of 2024, and he sort of invited me and he and he laid this out as like a a pathway, and and I realized this could really happen. So their story of the you know which is essentially the story of the Jews of Sanok with my family as the the central characters, but it does tell the broader story could actually come back to this town. So indeed, just uh, uh, a month ago, I was there uh, uh, showing film uh, in in the town they were born. And it was it was amazing. Like people were very, very curious. Um, we can talk more about this, but the, the, people, the people in Poland are, it's not the same generation that were there before. Um, and they're very interested in, in Jewish culture now, or more interested, I should say. And we had a screening, an outdoor screening, and about a 40-minute Q&A, and it was remarkable. And, and I walked back to their land, and I, I, I uh, FaceTimed with my aunt, you know, uh, in, from the town square, and we were looking for where her father's butcher shop was, and we went to their, to their land, and we saw the fruit trees that were like, – we, I literally walked in their steps and while we were screening the film, and – and you know, we also went to Warsaw as well. We can talk about that, but um, yeah, it was a remarkable homecoming, and the feeling of coming full circle. And and the museum director wants to acquire, wants to to get a copy of the film with the Polish subtitles that I made to show to all high school students, sort of from here on in in Sanok. And it really, yeah, and there's an author there who's writing a book, who's going to do a chapter on our family. She's writing a book on the people of the Sun River kind of before the war. So, you know, it's I feel like I've taken their seeds and I've replanted them back in the family plot in a different way. And for all of Poland and Polish Jews, kind of like this is these people. And you know what? They left and they did OK. But unlike some they actually had very fond memories of Poland and and that was something you know not everyone knows and there is a potential for reconciliation there and this was sort of a little piece of reconciliation for the Poles who like you know uh we came back for them and uh and for my family in a way too who were very thrilled. And my Auntie Ruthie, she, she wishes she could have come with us. Mm -hmm. You know, she just physically couldn't. But, um, you know, like it it reconnected some dots. So very rare to be able to do that in that way. Usually it's graveyards and, and, and yeah. death camps and, and tears. And this was something different. That was your first trip to Poland in your life? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go to uh, one of the concentration camps or anything? Yeah, yeah, we we went to Auschwitz, Birkenau, because we were in um, um, uh, Krakow. Um, yeah, and and that's, I mean, that is everyone should experience it and shouldn't have to experience it at the same time. It's it's gut wrenching, but it's extremely well preserved and it's turned into a museum and it's gigantic and and one really does. It is a it remains a, a witness. 
to to the horror and uh, to the Holocaust. You know, the film has, it's a lot about resilience, but you know, I always say you know, being Jewish sometimes is an act of spite. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, no, not yet. We're still here, right? Well, that, and, you know, that was, that was my mother's line, uh, which I quote her at the end, that they always said the best revenge against Hitler is to live a long life. And and they did. They, so it, it was... A long life and, you know, from all, I can see a happier life than than a, a bitter life. They, 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 they had each other. They knew what mattered. What's your... What has this done to your Jewishness or your Jewish identity, if anything? Well, I think I think it's caused me to hew uh, more closely to to my people in a way to be more motivated to you know I mean I can't I can't separate this from everything that's going on in the world right now that is further you know issues of anti-Semitism and, and the wars um, everything is bringing me closer to. Uh, wanting to, to be around uh, Jews more and and to and to tell my story more to be um, to 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 bring this out there everyone to uh, I mean I took the film to um, uh, a public school grades five six seven eight and to you know to be to be uh, an educator of the history of our history so it's kind of rooted me a little more as a chronicler of my people's history as a storyteller of, of, of the Holocaust and, and just co communally to be um, a little closer maybe to my community. Do, do you see the legacy in, inside yourself uh, as one of uh, trauma or do you see it as one of uh, a beautiful story? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the, 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 uh, not, not so much the trauma, the idea of, I guess, the concept of survival has always uh, been like firmly in the back of my brain somewhere. The idea, the notion of survival, but also that survival is possible and survival works. Um, the clouds of trauma were were less so. I was a little younger than perhaps my, you know, my sister was born in a in Germany in a displaced persons camp and was a little closer. She had to go through all the firsts. You know the mistrust of the, you know the of the outward of the people the the outward world. Uh, things were broken. The barriers were broken already by the time I got on. So I I chose to identify more with the upbeat resilience within my family um, because that that's really what they they weren't they were different right. There's different ways people uh, process uh, the trauma of the of the Shoah and World War II. And I am fortunate that they um, processed it in a way that was gets get beyond it and, and more celebratory in a way. Yeah, I mean, you flip, in crossing the river, you, you flip a few things, like Stalin is a good guy. Stalin is the unlikely hero. I would... And I would never say that myself. Auntie Ruthie says that. She says, you know, who knew Stalin would save our lives? It's a bit of a cheeky, well, she's cheeky, but it, it it's true, actually. Uh, in an earlier iteration, I was looking for titles for the film. And I was like, okay, uh, Stalin saved us, or saved by Stalin. I thought, oh, that'd be a cheeky... Uh, a friend of mine who's a, a historian uh, at a university, she said, no, yeah. don't do that. Um, you'll have... Um, you, you know, have pickets uh, on your on, in front of the opening night. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. So yeah. uh, even though I'd be out there going, no, no, you don't understand. It's a, yeah. It's a, <laughs> Forget the forty million people that he killed. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a joke. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So it's so interesting to, but the whole film is like that. It's like you're supposed to be going to misery, and you keep going to hope and resilience, and 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 uh, you know, the proof is in their long lives. I mean, it's remarkable to see all these people, ten centenarians, you know, still together in Winnipeg, of all places, doing their yeah. thing, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, two have since passed, of course. Yeah. Uh, since finishing. Um, but, yeah. As of the finish of the film and the screening, they were all together. Yeah. So amazing you got that. Um, it's a short now. It's 30 minutes, right? 30, yeah. So do you have plans for more? to make it longer 
you know, I, it, I I had a longer version, uh, and I had um, um, I brought my cousin on as a producer and another producer in New York, and they were both. I wanted to cram everything in. Oh, there's Uncle Moisha, and you know he left his family, and then he went to Saib, and then he came, you know, and then he did his thing, and then there's there's my father, and he was a kibbutz organizer, and then he, you know, like there were all these interesting stories, and and kind of the guidance I got was no, you have to you have to keep the through line of the of the Schwesters, of the siblings and Saul. Um, so I had to sort of chop off those limbs. And I do admit it's a it's a cleaner, clearer journey rather than veering off. So I don't think I'm going to make it longer. There are more stories to tell, but you know, in some ways you have to know your your main story and you can't can't dance at every wedding. You can't tell every story. Maybe there'll be a, another series, but you know, like you have your main story. So I just yeah, yeah. closely to that. Um, if you would, if you could sum up the experience of doing all this, um, how, how somebody said, you know, what was it like? What do you got? What was it? You know, what did it bring out in you? What would you say is the kind of, lesson you learned or the things that you feel now that you didn't feel before it was so it was so gratifying to i guess connect with my extended family as well because people people were were coming in as well as the four siblings um you know i, I was on a, a massive a treasure hunt for for family and story so it's like you know oh um, there was an uncle, uncle moisha who died and like where is the box of his treasures, his photos, and then going to find cousins and everyone kind of digging through. And then like, you know, ah, there's that, that one, the child of the second cousin who perished. And then to bring, because what I was doing is I was, I was giving face and voice to all these faceless, you know, the, the fuzzy little pictures that you see on these uh, faces that you see on these old pictures. And then, to talk about them and then, ah, yes, you were actually named after that uncle. And, and he, and he drew amazing murals and he played music. And then you see, and to, to uncover those photos and then to use the AI to kind of um, uh, extract the details out of it and then bring them into color. So it was kind of like this real connection to, 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 to distant family who have now come right into my daily life and I can talk about them, and I know what they were like. So it was this experience of of um, recovering precious memories that so many people have no access to. And I, I was able to find this portal through these tools and this process to kind of almost like to get to know the family that I I never could have, and then all my extended cousins and uncles and aunts, just everyone getting on board with the project. So yeah, it was a real a remarkable reconnection for our whole family, extending back a hundred years. Is uh, Crossing the River going to air uh, air anywhere or are you, do you have more festivals you're doing? Or? Uh, it's going to be in the Victoria a Jewish Film Festival on November 4th. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Mm. Um uh, talking to Vancouver, they couldn't schedule it now, but they want to do it in in the coming um, year. Uh, I'm talking to the JCC in Toronto about doing a screening at the Leah Poslin's Theater. So hopefully that, uh, you know, I just want to get it out there. Yeah, um, it's uh, PBS New York has indicated they want to broadcast it. Um, in typical fashion, you know, CBC is like, oh yeah, we don't do 30 minute docs. And TV Ontario has been sitting on it for three months going, well, we're still waiting to hear. Um, slight bit of bitterness there, but, you know, Canadian, hold your breath for Canadian broadcasters to show uh, an independent film like this. So best bet is uh, JCC, maybe PBS will come on board here, like in Buffalo. And there's also a platform people can see it right now. Uh, it's called kinema.com. Uh, it's like cinema, except with a K, kinema, K-I-N-E-M-A, uh -huh. dot com. And if you search Crossing the River, uh, it'll pop right up and you can watch it now um, at, a, at a fee for streaming. 
I'd be happy to get it on TV here, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy you got to do this. I'm so happy that your mother got to know that you did it. Uh, and not just, you know, anything else, but that you did that. I, I know she always kind of thanked God for you and your storytelling and that quirky kid who ran around with an eight millimeter, you know, taking his home of everything <laughs> in life, ends up going, well, good, that's my archives. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? And and then I'd come back in the early years and my uncle saw that I'd, I'd come back and I'd be, you know, gushing about, you know, how much I love film, whatever. And then Uncle Saul turned to me, go, you know, medicine wouldn't be a bad profession for you. <laughs> you had a heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still trying. But you know, they okay. kind of they kind of dropped that in in and about uh uh you know, around nineteen ninety, whatever. Once I was <laughs> yeah, once but, I got a few jobs, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. What it's like, oh you can make money, you didn't starve. Boy, yes. they almost starved. That's all I know. Uh, yes. You know, bargaining for some crumbs. Um, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. And uh, it's called Crossing the River. You can go to kinema.com. It starts with a K, but the rest looks like cinema. Kinema.com to, uh, to stream it, uh, pay a small fee, and watch the 30-minute uh, the, the, the uh, movie. And uh, I'm glad you did it for your sake. Uh, and for mine, because I, I, you know, these kinds of stories aren't told very often. It, they're usually misery stories. This one is one about resilience and love, and I just think it's great. Thank you. The Siberian Jews—that's what they they were called, apparently. Um, and yeah, filling in a bit of history. That Sounds like a hockey out. team. Alan Novak, Crossing the River, is the name of the film we've been talking about. I'm Ralph Ben Murgy. This is not that kind of rabbi. You take care of each other. <laughs>